Hello and welcome to this event from the British Library, uh, part of our nature season, The Natural Word. I'm Brett Walsh of the Cultural Events Department. As you can see, I'm not in the library today. I'm talking to you from my garden in South London, but the library is open for readers now and our exhibitions will be opening very soon. So if you'd like to book your place, please do visit our website. It's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event, a conversation between Anita Setti and Caroline Sanderson. Anita is going to be talking about her new book, I Belong Here, which is out today. So if you'd like to order a copy, please do so using the button just above the video. Now, before I hand over to Caroline, I've just got a few points of housekeeping. We will be taking a public Q&A towards the end of the event. So if you've got a question for Anita, please do submit it using the Q&A form just below the video. In the menu above, you'll find a bookshop link. You'll also find a button to give us your feedback. Your feedback is really important, so we hope you'll take the time to fill that out. And we'll also there's also a button uh, to donate to the library. The library is a charity, so your donations are really appreciated. So Caroline Sanderson is a writer and journalist who regularly interviews writers on page, stage and screen. She is associate editor of The Bookseller, is artistic director of the Stroud Book Festival and associate fellow of the Royal Literary Fund. As well as all this, she is also the author of five non-fiction books of her own. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Caroline and Anita. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome from me, too. Um, to be chairing this event tonight is a huge pleasure and honour for me. Firstly, because I am myself a loyal out-of-town member of the British Library, and I can't wait to get myself back into the building in person. But secondly, because I have long been an admirer of the journalism and author interviews of our guest tonight, Anita Sethi and now I get to interview her. And then there's her book, I Belong Here, a journey along the backbone of Britain. I've been previewing new nonfiction for the bookseller magazine every month for more than 20 years. And hopefully by now, I mostly know when I'm in the presence of a very special book such as this. After reading Anita's book, I wrote, I Belong Here is a shining example of how books at their best can be an act of resistance and a communal force for good. And I truly believe that that's what this book is. Anita, welcome to you. It's so fabulous to be doing this launch event with you. And thanks so much for asking so much. me to do it. It's publication day. Congratulations. It how Thank does you. it feel? How does it Very feel? Very exciting. It's really, really exciting to actually see it out in the world and thank you so much for doing this thank you so much for to the British Library for hosting it and thank you to everyone watching at home it's really exciting um, to actually have the book launched and also very lucky that bookshops are actually open um, it was amazing because I actually saw it on a bookshop shelf for the first time and actually it felt real for the first time so oh, hurrah hurrah now you've had some really cracking reviews already. Uh, the Guardian said it was a book of rare power and the Sunday Times said this book is a thing of beauty. And of course, Robert McFarlane said it was a brilliant, brave and important book. Um, now, it, as I said, it's reinforced my belief in books as a force for good, but of course its writing was sparked by something really quite horrific, uh, a, a, a race hate crime of which you were a victim while traveling on a train through the Northern England. Now, I'm not gonna go into the details of what happened now because people can read about it in your book and I'd, I'd rather talk about the book, but suffice it to say that you courageously reported the crime and the man responsible was arrested and later convicted. So can we start by you telling us how this horrendous incident, and I might say it was by not the first time in your life that you've faced racism, how did this incident lead to you deciding to walk the Pennine Way? Thank you. Yeah, well, as you say, it's not the first time that it's happened, but I was on a Trans-Pennine train going from Liverpool to Newcastle one day, and I was going to the northern launch of a new anthology that I'm in called Common People, and a man started racially abusing me on the train. I won't repeat what he said um, in case there were young people watching, and... Um, 
but he told me to go back to where I'm from and I'm from the north I mean the train that I was on actually passed through Manchester on the way and so I decided to do what the man told me I went back to where I'm from so one day I was looking at a map of the Pennines and it happened to be a Trans-Pennine train and there rose miniature mappings of mountains and hills and the Pennine Way snaked through my dreams all summer, tempting me to walk upon it and make a journey of reclamation. And that's exactly what I did. So the title of the book is I Belong Here, A Journey Along the Backbone of Britain. And the title's kind of, it has threefold meaning because it's obviously what I'm saying in response to the man who told me I didn't belong here. It's also something nature itself is saying because nature was extremely, healing to me I found a lot of solace in it throughout my journey walking through the natural landscapes of the north and the great Pennine range and I would listen to the birds singing and wonder what they might be singing and I felt that they might be saying I belong here and I belong here is also something the book itself is saying because for far too long you know the stories of marginalized groups have been treated as if they don't belong in books so I did want to put this story down in book form which is why it's particularly nice as well to be doing the launch event with the British Library which is a absolute haven of books and since childhood I have sought refuge in libraries and surrounded by books so to to launch my own with the British Library where I've spent so much so much time in the reading rooms um is is great so yeah, I think you've just given us a hint there of how many layers there are in this book, which is something I want to talk about in a minute. But why don't we have uh, get a flavour of of your beautiful writing? Um, I think you I think you're going to read us something. Yes, I've got a little bit you? to read. I won't read too much because Caroline has loads of wonderful questions as an expert interviewer. But so the book is um, structured around the body. It has parts called mouth, which is about speaking up, skin which is obviously drawing on my experience of racism. But then I progressively wanted to get deeper beneath the skin and show what runs skin deep. So there's also a section called backbone. And the word backbone was resonant and powerful to me as I walk because it's, it refers to what's known as a backbone of Britain, the great Pennine range of mountains uh, made from limestone and something called windsill. And Obviously, then it took, took, took on other meanings about what does it mean to have backbone? And um, then the next section is lifeblood, something that you know, I wanted to get beneath the skin and show you know, the oxygen and lifeblood that flows through all of us. And then it closes with the feet. But the prologue is called A Place Called Hope. And I will read a little bit from that. I watched the wings as they soared through the sky. So sure of itself, so confident was a curly as it caressed the cloud. So in its element, where do I belong? Such a perennial question of existence. And I remember the flight of that curly I saw in the Pennines when I considered the quest for a sense of belonging. The bird belongs in its fine feathers and in its nest and in the air, flying through the sky with such ease and grace. The fish belongs in its spectacular scales and in its watery habitat. All belongs in soil in its state of becoming, growing towards the light. How could I feel a sense of belonging in my own body, in my own self, in the world? What does it mean to belong? What does it mean to feel like you don't belong? How can nature help us to find a greater sense of belonging? And how can we ensure people care enough to realise that nature and wildlife belong as much to the world as humans do? All my life I felt like I didn't belong. And I grew used to that sense of belonging. Being an outsider has shaped my life in many ways and made me become a writer. But there comes a time when it's necessary to say, I belong here. It might come when someone is trying to push you from a place to eradicate you. It might come when your basic rights are being denied. It might come when you are struggling to breathe clean air, when you are struggling to breathe at all. It's exhausting having to prove and explain why we belong. Yet so often have I had to do so on account of multiple macro and microaggressions. Ultimately, I hope for a world in which every creature, great and small, is accepted, and I don't have to say it at all. I was on a journey through northern England in early summer 2019, when I became the victim of a hate crime, when, attack, when a man attacked my right to belong here with words that hurt the very heart of me. 
The North is my home, having been born and bred in Manchester. The Transpennine Express train even passed through the city on its route from Liverpool to Newcastle. The hate crime was a vicious attack on my right to exist in a place on account of my race. I was told to get back on the banana boat and go back to where you're from, yet this country is where I belong. Hate crime is on the rise in our hostile environment. After the attack, some advised me to stop travelling alone due to the dangers, and I experienced panic attacks and anxiety at the thought of travelling by myself. But I was intent on not letting a hate crime stop me moving about freely and without fear in a country where I belong. I was eager to continue travelling alone as a woman, asserting my right to exist. One day, I was looking at a map of the North, and there, along the route of my train journey, falls the Pennines, the backbone of England, with its nature reserves, national parks, and areas of outstanding natural beauty, an area of countryside designated for conservation due to its significant landscape value. My heart quickened as I looked at the miniature mappings of its mountains and rivers. The Trans-Pennine Express journey had run a route tantalizingly close to such Pennine areas, but it would take walking and local railways to fully explore it. I longed to journey through the natural landscapes of the North, transforming what began as an ugly experience of hate and exclusion into one offering hope and finding beauty after brutality. Go back to where you're from. This is where I'm from. I'm from the North, the glorious North. Our emotional connection with certain places runs deep and forceful as a river. And during and after the hate crime, I felt how profound my connection was with the North. Although a racist had viciously told me to leave, I felt a magnetic pull drawing me back, not to get further from it, but even deeper into it. My journey is one of reclamation, a way of saying to adapt the Woody Guthrie song title, this land is my land too, and I belong in the UK as a brown woman just as much as a white man does. Journeying through the so-called backbone of England also feels symbolic, a way of showing backbone myself and that I will not let having been victim of a race hate crime curtail my movements through the world, despite the trauma and panic attacks that followed. I began to devour more and more maps of the Pennines and plot out a route reading up about the Pennine Way, Britain's oldest long distance footpath, which runs for 431 kilometers through the backbone of Britain. As my claustrophobia grew, I began to long for wide open spaces, to breathe freely in the great outdoors. I hungered for greenness. I zoomed in on a map of the Peak District where the Pennine Way begins and where the North begins, its border. How glorious to glimpse a place named Hope. It's there I wanted to start my journey, walking through Hope Valley. The night before the hate crime, I had happened to stay in a place called Hope Street Hotel on Hope Street in Liverpool. My actual experiences turned out to be profoundly allegorical. Since then, I tried to channel hope throughout, drawing on hope at my lowest ebb. I felt strongly that journeying again through the North had something to offer me, and I wanted to follow that gut instinct. Places where traumatic events occur take on even greater significance. They become a part of us, often drawing us back to the place to understand something about it, to transform it into a place of empowerment. And that's how I felt about the Trans-Pennine Express journey and my journey of reclamation through the Pennines. One day in midsummer, I finally make a move. I get the Hope Valley line from Manchester reopened after some storm closure. I see flashes of purple Rose Bay willow herb through the window. I step off the train into Edale, the gateway to the Pennines, and feel the noise of the city fall away. As the train engines fade, silence envelops me, but for the bird song. I had known little about this history when I boarded the Hope Valley line train to Edale. What a symbolic place it is to walk through as I assert my right to roam through the world. For it's here, near the Kinder Scout Moorland Plateau, that the Manchester Ramblers campaigned for access to private, to, to greater access to the countryside. Their walk was celebrated in the folk song, The Manchester Rambler by poet and folk singer, Ewan McCall, who marched during the protest and knew that walking could be a radical and political act and lead to change. That walking could be a way of saying, I belong here. Thank you very much. Come back to more reading later, but I think it would be good to have some questions. Yes. 
Yes, I, I mean, I, I, it just reminds me so much of the first time that I, I read the book and how powerful that, that, that prologue is. And this extraordinary, as you say, that this profoundly allegorical journey that you set out on, because not only is this, um, you know, what we think of as classic work of nature writing and travel writing, so it charts a journey and you describe the landscape and you describe the nature around you. Um, but, but it's, you know, it's this allegorical thing that is so powerful about it. So you Thank set you. out on this walk along the Pennine Way through a sedimentary limestone landscape built up of many strata. You see, I looked up my geology. Thank you. Um, and, and when I was reading it, that's how I came to think of your book, right. that a book of layers and preoccupations. And it feels as if, you know, you're your inner journey follows your outer journey. Did, is, is that, was that your experience of it at the time? Yeah, thank you, Caroline. I could listen to you talk about the book all day, which is why I kind of, st I stumbled over my reading and stopped it. No one else wants to listen to me talking about the book. listening to Caroline talk about the book. I have to say, you know, like I'm a first time, this is my first book. And one of the magical things has been having it meet the readers like people have been asking me was it cathartic to write the book and make the journey and, you know one of the most amazing things is actually having it meet readers like yourself and having Caroline was one of my first readers and did an amazing piece interview in the bookseller and it was you know the first published piece that came out about the book and you know I was blown away by your reading of it and I loved how you described these um sedimentary you know picked up on that in the book so thank you first of all for such a perceptive reading but absolutely um the allegorical quality of the journey was something that the landscape gave to me um you know it was just and that was one of the magical things about the northern the natural landscapes from the north and about nature it does have this incredibly metaphorical and symbolic quality so I started off in hope and um hope was you know, it's the name of a place, but it's also something that I try to channel throughout. And it was actually literally seeing the place named Hope when I was quite immobilized with anxiety after the race, racist attack. Um, anxiety is a very immobilizing thing. It leads to inertia, where I was traveling and what has become what some describe as a travel book. It's also a blend of nature writing and so on. It's the opposite of that. It's the opposite of being inert. And it was, it was the place name called Hope that really made me get up and make the journey. If I had not zoomed in on the map that, you know, auspicious evening and seen a place called Hope, I'm not sure I would have actually made that journey. So Hope, I, I, literally, I did literally channel Hope throughout. That was one layer of allegory. And then the other, um, as you so picked up on in your lovely piece that you wrote about the book, um, there was a place name called Settle. And that's a place in the Yorkshire Dales. And I had never even heard of Settle before. You know, I grew up in Manchester and didn't really go on trips to the lovely Yorkshire Dales. And so when I arrived at this place called Settle, it was just triggered off so many thoughts about, I mean, this is a journey for me. It's an emotional and personal journey, as well as a journey along the back bend of Britain and a journey through our country's shared history. But that made me think about what does it mean to be settled and um, what what does it mean to be settled in the lives we've constructed as human beings. But I also wanted to ask, can being more immersed in the wild and wilderness and nature, can that paradoxically make us feel more settled? So then I kind of explored the history of civilization and how human beings started off as travelers and nomads walking the land and um, and when I was in Settle train station as well, I, um, I saw a map on the wall, which was dedicated to Wainwright, who was a famous traveler. And he wrote a book. That's when I learned about a book, a very quite a slim book of travel writing he wrote called A Pennine Journey. And then that gave me further inspiration to make the rest of my journey and think about the shape of the journey I wanted to make because obviously you have the Pennine Way which is Britain's oldest long distance footpath and um, it starts in the Peak District which this this month actually celebrates its 70th anniversary and um, it was created as I say by the amazing campaigning work 
um, of people like the Manchester Ramblers who walked for to open up the countryside. And then I saw this, um, the Pennine journey, and it made me feel more flexible about the journey, the route I wanted to take. So that all happened at Settle, and just thought it was an amazing place to 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 walk through because of the allegory. And then another, uh, oh, and Wainwright's journey ended in, at Hadrian's Wall, and that's why I decided to end my journey at Hadrian's Wall. He made his journey in 1938 when Britain was on the cusp of um, World War. It's a very, it was a politically anxious time, but we are also have been living in such a, partic- a politically turbulent time. Hadrian's Wall became a, a symbol of empire, of immigration, of um, border building. And so that was the end of my journey. And then other layers of allegory included um, walking through scars. Yes. So I, I mean, I just thought it was amazing to learn because um, it was a learning journey for me as well. Like the etymology, as you know, from the book, I'm a total word geek. I love where, where words come from. So not only the history of places, but of prose and the roots of words. So the word learn actually means to follow a path. And um, so I was like learning and yearning my way through the Pennines, literally. So the word um, scar is, has multiple meanings. It means a limestone cliff, an outcrop. Well, then you have all the other resonant meanings of scar, like um, so physical and emotional wounds. So in the book, I make a journey through what I term the wonderland. I mean, the, the North is an incredibly scarred landscape. It's a very rich metaphorical place. So I was literally walking along a scar and walking deeper into the wonderland. So my journey was partly seeking solace and escaping in the beautiful hills, but it was also confronting and facing um, fears and you know looking deeper into the roots of of trauma as well and that was another layer of um, allegory and and it kind of yeah I just I just loved that and then it was a landscape that gave me that and of course the main um the main layer of symbolism is is the backbone at the heart of the book is the um backbone that will just I mean that and in that sparked my imagination from you know the backbone of Britain the fact that the Pennine range is called the backbone of Britain that you know, that gave me the whole idea for the book and it gave me the idea as we spoke about before of um, structuring the book around the body because I just love the fact that a part of the landscape was named after a part of the body the backbone and that gave me the idea to then build a structure around skin which was obviously at the heart of my experience then to go deeper beneath the skin and show what is deeper than the skin the fact that each and every human being um needs oxygen oxygen comes from you know nature it's, it's from trees and it was really you know it was my bird watching adventure with margaret atwood that made me think more deeply about nature as well because she said um you know loving your neighbor means loving the air in their lungs and if you love the air in their lungs you have to love what makes the air in their lungs which is nature it's it's um trees which create oxygen it's plants and so um I really wanted to get beneath the skin as well. So it was the backbone and then, and then lifeblood after backbone is lifeblood and, um, f- and the lifeblood again, that's the, the metaphor of the rivers that, um, that flow through the North. My journey was structured around um, following the course of four rivers. So the river air, Ribble, Tyne and Tees. And um, I was fascinated by what's known as blue care as well as there's green care, which is how being in green spaces is so important to us, but also blue care being near water is so good for the mental health and well-being. And I really found that on my journey as well. So as you say, you know, I just wanted in the book to, I was just really excited by like peeling away all those kind of symbolic layers of the landscape, but it was the landscape that gave it to me, gave me that really, because of, you know, that all the symbolic place names in the north it was the glorious north that gave it gave me the structure of the book and the names of the books yeah and i hope everybody listening to you talking can just hear about how all these intertwinings of all these different elements of the book and it's it's really quite magical what what you create out of you know something something terrible you know well, I mean, and and your your assertion of identity i was just going to go to go I was just yeah. going on to say, you know, that the, the the you talking about the people uh, activism of people, for example, on Kinder Scout, the mass trespass you write about, um, 
and uh, you you write about your your own your diverse heritage, which connects you to Asia and to the Caribbean and to South America and Africa, as well as being a proud Northern Englander. Yes. Um, but this this also leads to I think you touched on in the beginning this this lifelong feeling of not quite belonging anywhere. So that that. I, I, you know, I have to say this, you know, it's something that made me think very hard about my own privilege of being deemed to belong wherever I go because of my skin colour. You know, you you really, really made me think about that in a way that, you know, I absolutely needed to. But, um, but you you know, you, your reclamation of identity is all bound up with this closeness to the, to the land and your feet, the placing of your feet, one foot in front mm. of another. You write about the power of, of, of walking as well. Yeah, so thank you. And I, I think that really ties in with what you picked. You used the word magical there. And I did want to I did want to create something joyful and magical um, out of the book. I did want the book to be that. And I'll tell you why, what my inspiration and driving force was that, because that summer that I was racially abused, a friend of mine also died very young she died um, very suddenly so the amazing Sophie Christopher she was only 28 years old and she had sent me a card and the card was called it was a thank you card for interviewing an author that she works with and the card was called a little card full of magic and joy so those words drove me on magic and joy as I wanted the book to be filled with magic and joy because it captures that her spirit as well um there's two dedications to the book is in memoriam Sophie Christopher also dedicated to, to everyone who's ever felt they don't belong. In answer to your question about outsiderness and belonging, I think that space of being an outsider, it can be that liminal space can be, you know, it can feel like, like a negative space that can swallow you up and it can be a lonely space, but it can also be a very magical and creative space if you then inhabit it and then you can use that space and reclaim it as your own. So I think that, that was the, for me, what became the magic of making the journey was that I used that space not to like be engulfed with loneliness of being an outsider, but to reclaim yeah. it as my own. It can be like a kind of alchemy. Someone sent a really mean tweet saying, um, like I talk about the, the, you know, the, the, when you speak out and you're a woman of color, you're subjected to all kinds of like racist trials. And someone said, the children of immigrants are fated to never belong. That's your fate. And that's just completely ridiculous because I mean my point in the book is that you know I belong here as much as the white man the man who racially abused me does and you know it's called a journey along the backbone of Britain and I explore Britishness in the book and you know the first thing he said to me is do you have a British passport there's many ironies to my experience one was that I had my British passport in me in my handbag because I just got back um the same week from the, the former British colony where my mother was born, British Guyana. So a key point in the book is that um, brown and black people are no less British than white people. And I think that needs to be understood very clearly because that affects how people um, regard um, brown and black people as belonging or not belonging to Britain. So, you know, that is a very important for people to understand. And I don't think people understand that. And the reason that I explore in the book why they don't is because there's, you know, um, his, British history has been whitewashed from the curriculum. So I talk about being, you know, a brown skinned child growing up in Manchester and learning more about Henry VIII's wives and colouring in their costumes more than I did about the history of our, our country, about immigration and colonialism, which is just shocking to me that, you know, we aren't taught more about it. And that therefore affect the, the very toxic idea that brown and black people are somehow not as British as white people, then affects how we are regarded as belonging or not belonging in places regarded as quintessentially British and English, like the English countryside, like green landscapes. I mean, it's a ridiculous notion that we somehow don't belong walking through the countryside. So I wanted to smash those toxic notions and show and say, you know, we do belong. I'm just as British as a white person and I belong here just as much as a white person and I belong in brown and black people belong in green spaces just as much as well. Yeah and, and, and such such an important point from your book and I, I, I was going on to mention you know the the pandemic that we've all been living through has 
you know, prompted even more talk and discussion about how essential nature is to yes. all our well-being, something that you've clearly lived and breathed. And, it, you know, there, there is that in this book. Um, and not just over the past two years. I know you did an event in um, in Kendall in the Lake District last year with Lucy yeah. Jones, who's the author oh, of yeah, Losing, yeah. Losing yeah. Eden, which is about how our minds need the wild. Yes. But, you know, just to pick up on what you were Absolutely. saying there, you know, you're also arguing passionately that the natural world and nat- national parks, access to the countryside, again, we're talking about the, you know, looping back to the Kinder Scout mass trespass, which you mentioned right at the beginning of your yeah. book. Yeah. It, it, it's most especially needed by those who've suffered deprivation yeah. and prejudice. And I think we too often think of our wild spaces as white spaces and in, in terms of what we read about them as well, I think. Yeah. Um, it's- yeah, I was just going to say this might be a good time to introduce your I Belong Here Foundation work. As yeah, well. thank you, Caroline. And I think thank you so much for raising that point because it's an incredibly important aspect of the book. I mean, it's very much a book about mental health and the importance of um, you know acknowledging mental health and the fact of how much nature and walking is beneficial for our physical and mental well-being. And, you know, that's that's a key message of the book, absolutely. When I um, was suffering from anxiety and depression, making this journey through nature was hugely beneficial for my mental health. But and I think there's a really toxic notion as well. And I think it comes from the notion that brown and black people are somehow not as human, that our mental health isn't as, as important. There's never a conversation about our mental health in the, in the media. You, and, and I do think it's important for... That's why I think it's important, you know, for someone who isn't white to say, you know, mental health is also important to me. Our well-being is important. And to lead on to your question about the I Belong Here Foundation, yeah, I'm thrilled that the news today is um, announced by the Royal Society of Literature that um, I've been awarded um, a Royal Society of Literature Literature Matters Award to run a series of um, Northern Nature Writers workshops nature writing workshops um so and to establish something called the northern nature writers network of ne- and, and run workshops and create a network and as you say there's a massive inequality in access to nature that's another something else i explore in the book um you know not every and lockdown has shown that inequality really heartbreaking I mean, you know there's people who've been trapped in in tower blocks without access to nature and then there's people have been tweeting their social media pictures about lovely walks in in the local woods so lockdown has shown systemic inequality of all kinds including an access to nature so I want the book um, I've taught shared my story in the book but I also want to help other people feel as if they belong and um, through through the I Belong Here Foundation and initiatives such as um, the Royal Society of Literature's award for me to start the Northern Nature Writers Network and run nature writing workshops for those who couldn't otherwise afford to do them. I hope to create a sense of belonging and access to nature for everyone and not just for the privileged. So that everyone can, can say, I belong here. It's such tremendous news. I'm, I'm, I'm so thrilled Thank for you, you because um it's your initiative is is really um you know sorely needed and 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 wonderful to have you at the <laughs> at the center of it and i know that you you know you know of what you speak here because um you also write in the book about your childhood yeah. uh you grew up right in the heart of manchester you yourself had very little access to uh there were there were a few parks I think you had very little yeah. access to nature and um there's a wonderful piece and I'm just going to flash this anthology yeah. what well, you've con- contributed to lots of anthologies but this is winter yeah. um edited by Melissa Harrison and it there's a wonderful piece in there by you which um perhaps you'll tell us about it's it's about your your mother planting bulbs in the garden yeah and, and as I say I do think the issue of um mental health is is stigmatized um um, too much and it's stigmatized um, more for some than others and I did want to smash the stigma around mental health and say you know so many of us have experienced depression and anxiety so I write about how um, my my uh, one of my earliest sometimes I'm asked what's what's your earliest memory of nature one of my earliest memories of nature is understanding what a bulb was so um 
in this small garden in in the city so my first experience of the wild wasn't the massive you know rain pennine range of the countryside it was this it was it was the nearby nature which we're all coming to appreciate in lockdown and um it was um noticing a ladybird crawling along concrete it was noticing you know a wildflower growing in in the cracks between a pavement and, but this particular thing was about um um yeah that my, my childhood garden the garden in my childhood home and so my mum who was suffering depression at the time planted um bulbs in the garden and started cultivating the garden and it's about the therapeutic aspect of having that close connection with the natural world so I remember the first I remember the bulbs being planted and, and knowing that something magical would happen from them but not really understanding what a bulb was until I saw the first daffodil it's quite Wordsworthian but you know in a city ch children from cities can have Wordsworthian experiences of nature as well and you know the, so it was that first daffodil when once I saw a golden daffodil in Manchester <laughs> so it was the words it was the golden daffodil that Wordsworth has you know every, every it's a very very primal thing so what I wanted to show in the book is that the connection with nature and how important it is for our physical and mental well-being is something each and every one of us regardless of our social racial or cultural background experiences it's an incredibly primal part of being human because we are not apart from nature we're all a part of nature as, as I say you know nature flows through our lungs it flows through our veins as soon as we breathe in we're breathing oxygen created by trees we're inhaling nature so yeah that was um, and I do think it's a you know remembering our it was we, we haven't been able to go anywhere in lockdown apart from nearby and local um you know local areas so I think remembering memories of nature are, have been more important than ever as well and drawing on them for for sustenance and so yeah I think it's um I think the um link between nature and mental health and how important it is for all our mental health is incredibly important to remember and to understand as well and also the fact that you know the book is also a clarion call it's about my advent I mean epic adventure in the Pennine countryside but it's also a clarion call and a cry from the heart to, for access to nature for those in cities our city I, I really hope that you know now lockdown's being eased I hope that come 21st of June the summer solstice um, when lockdown is supposed to be lifted um, I hope the world will be recalibrated into a better world. And there were all these hopes after the lockdown 1.0. It didn't seem to happen. So I hope after, you know, lockdown 3.0, the world will be recalibrated into a more equal world, a cleaner, greener world for those in cities. You know, we might need more trees and green spaces and parks in cities for everyone to access. We need more nearby nature. And we need to recalibrate the world so it's a more equal world and a world in which every single human being and every single creature, great and small, feels as if they belong in, because they do belong in it. And, you know, I start from the premise that the world is our shared home. You know, home is a big theme in the book, but it starts from the, from the idea that, you know, this world is all of our homes and we all belong here. Well, amen to that. I mean, we can only hope that that's where we'll be going um, from here. Um, I, it, it, I would like to move to some audience questions in just yes. a minute. So um, I'm just gonna ask you one more thing just to give everybody a chance yeah. to, to post if they haven't already done so. So um, you can do that uh, in the question box below the video feed if you haven't already done so. And I think I've got some coming through here. Uh, <laughs> so excuse, excuse me if I'm just looking down, Anita. Um, but I just wanted to, uh, I think talked a teeny bit more about the walking aspect of oh, yeah. it because we've yeah. talked a lot about the, the, the landscape and being in nature and you know uh, the mental health aspects of your book. But there's something there's something powerful about you, a woman on your own walking, uh, a woman of colour walking. But also, I, I think I said earlier that putting one foot in front of another, and you say something very interesting about embodiment and, oh yeah, uh, yeah could, could you just just talk to us for a minute about that because I, I was very yeah. struck by that thank you that's such a good question and it's so important to the book so 
um, anxiety, emotions such as anxiety, fear or depression, they can make you what's called be derealized or have a sense of disembodiment. And I do think, you know, experiences like racism lead people to not fully inhabit their own bodies because we've been culturally conditioned to think that like our skin color somehow isn't as good, you know, as white skin. We don't, I don't, I think, I don't think a lot of us fully inhabit ourselves and certainly experiences like anxiety leads to derealization and a sense of disembodiment, which is why walking is physiologically good for the well-being. Like I interviewed experts for the book, including Alan Kellis of the Royal Society of Psychiatrists. And, you know, they, they you know, shared their insight into what walking does to us physiologically and why it is actually good for us. And it does create a sense of embodiment. It makes you, it makes you be there. It makes you, you know, the, the books, I belong here. And to be able to say I belong here was a process of embodiment. And also I think society has, there's too much separation of body and mind in the way we think of ourselves. And actually the way we use our bodies is going to affect our emotional well-being because it's connected. So if you're walking, it improves your mood, it triggers off endorphins, the mind and body are profoundly connected. And that's another reason why I structured the book around the body to show how the body and mind are connected. So walking was, yeah, it was a profoundly embodying and inhabiting experience. Like I came to inhabit myself again. And so, you know, all of us, our home is also ourselves. So we, I belong here is saying that I belong in my own body, in my own self, in the world. So it was like an embodying experience. I had to learn to inhabit myself again when experiences like racism and um, especially when you've had, you've been, I, I was born into a world which was systemically equal, right? I grew up, you know, I was born into a world which was magazines I read as a child, as a teenager growing up, they were not like, were many brown models we were like in, in all the teenage fashion magazines that we saw we were made to think that you know it was bad to like have this skin color it wasn't something to you know be proud of and that's only really changed fairly recently in the scale of things and all of those that context leads to a sense of not fully inhabiting yourself so I do think context is important and you know that's why I wanted to show um one, as you um, picked up on so well in your write-up of the book, you know, you use the term current affairs. I wanted to show how individuals are connected to um, societies and the cultural context that we grow up in shapes who we are, how we think. And people say, is it a political book? And I'm like, well, there's, the personal is political. You can't really separate them. So by making the journey, I was walking through all, all those toxic notions that I have been I and so many others have um, been made to feel through societal conditioning and just smashing or like walking, walking them away really and learning to inhabit myself and you. Mm. That's so interesting. I have a question here from Jane Carruthers. She would like to know what's the most surprising thing you learned about yourself or more widely as a result of the journey you went on? She says she's really looking forward to reading the book. It sounds like it touches on so many important and timely topics, which it absolutely does. So yes, the most the most surprising thing you learned about yourself or more widely. Thank you. Well, I think that you can't walk, you can't make a journey um, along the Pennine Way, Britain's oldest long distance footpath without improving stamina. So, I mean, put it this way, I was terrible at PE at school. As any school friends out there watching this will know. <laughs> They will know that my school, my PE teachers will actually be in shock to know that I did this because I was not like the sporty kids. So, you know, I wasn't winning all the awards for, for physical activity at school, but that because I had inertia, I was, the, the teachers would write that I, I had inertia and that's because I had childhood anxiety. That's the reason why. And so um, it was my own stamina. And I, you know, I, I will say that it was like, I was, surprised by my own strength and you know a key thing in the book is about um notions of strength and when you look at the natural world one thing that I found empowering about it was how tenacious nature is so there's a phrase be more like lichen and then it's looking at notions like strength like spider silk is the strongest substance 
uh, you know, spider silk is, and that's another allegorical symbolic thing that I draw on from nature. You think the strongest substance is diamonds, actually spider silk is incredibly strong. So it was kind of finding the strength in my own self and knowing that I could rely on myself and that, you know, the resources that I needed were within myself and to trust myself more, mm. trust in my own strength as it were. Uh, I have a question from Tulula Ellender, and yeah. she would like to know, is there one place from your journey that feels like a particularly special, happy place for you? Absolutely. So um, it was when I reached the top of a mountain called Penny Ghent, and um, the journey was upwards. I was literally um, walking upwards through the hills. Um, and that was in, in Maya Angelou has the poem which was inspirational to me um you may kill me with your hatefulness but still like air i'll rise my journey was literally geographic it was geographically upwards but then emotionally upwards as well and so it was it was reaching the summit of penny again and um it was incredibly disappointing at first because i was stuck inside a cloud and it was a massive disappointment i, mean, I could not see a thing i could not see beyond my own hand and everyone would say everyone said you could you'll be able to get an amazing view and so it was disappointing but then I just waited for a while other walkers you know went just didn't have the pay they walked on and they missed it and then gradually the cloud began to clear and the world was like reborn again into color and then the greens and the blues and the golds all appeared and so for me it was as you you know that phrase it was a happy place because it was Again, another symbol, symbolic place saying that if you feel lost and stuck inside a cloud and you can't see anything beyond you, you know, just to the clouds will clear and the world will be reborn into lucid. It's possible to reach a place of lucidity and clarity after a time of being lost. Hmm. I love that. I, I love the um, the bit about Panigant. It's a, it's a, it's, Thank you. it's really interesting. Uh, the place you. I'm not going to reveal it now, but the place you stay is really interesting. Oh, yeah. You meet yeah. particularly yeah. interesting, I think. Um, I don't have a name for this question, but um, uh, there's a question here, which is, what is your notion of home? We talked about settle, didn't we? And well, we I would prefer that. There's a million dollar question. What is your, what is my notion of home? I think it's an <laughs> incredibly interesting question. And I would point people towards my I Belong Here playlist. I have oh, yes. I that. a very extensive list of songs about home. I mean, this question is a question that writers, musicians and artists have been grappling with since the dawn of time. What is home? Where is home? So on the playlist, I have um, songs ranging from wherever I lay my hat. That's my home. And at the moment, I would say pretty much that's my answer because I'm a bit, you know, unsettled so wherever I lay my hat that's my home and also the fact that you know I do think it's um home is we do need to feel a sense of home um in places where we're perceived as not belonging so one of the epigraphs that closes the book is um you don't belong um no place you belong every place and that's another Maya Angelou quote you belong every place so I kind of my notions of I used to like search for a fixed sense of home and um, feel extremely anxious if I didn't have, you know, a, a very a, the kind of home that we are. Again, it's about societal cultural conditioning. People have a very traditional notion of home and what family is and family structures. And we're conditioned to feel like that and feel that oh, we don't quite belong. We don't have a home if our home doesn't conform to a traditional stereotype. But I just think those notions are so toxic. For example, you know, if like, I grew up in a home which was, you know, I have divorced parents and that was very stigmatized in the 80s. It was somehow seen as uh, what was called, people would use the phrase broken home, which is such a negative thing to say, broken home, you come from a broken home. So I kind of smash all those ideas of home and say, well, home is quite an organic concept and home is I just think home can be much more fluid concepts and you can make your own home for yourself and fundamentally when you start from the idea that the world is your home it's all of our shared home I think all of the kind of toxic political 
um, barriers between us, racial and societal barriers between us just naturally dissolve when you realize that, you know, the world is our home. It's a very simple thing to say, but you know, the world is my, the world is our home. It's all of our homes. But I do also say that, you know, I find a home in words as well. So for me, writing the book was making a home for myself. And I do think a lot of writers and artists, musicians feel that if when you grow up, when, if you grow up with a more complex sense of home, as I did, I always did. For me, you know, writing is making a home for myself out of words. So I always found that I found that when I've, I've written since childhood and I'd write stories. Reading is very much giving a home for for yourself as well. It's a home for your mind. So I'd say in terms of notions of home, writing this book was making a home for my story of belonging. So this is my story's home and books are books can provide a sense of home in that way. It might not be homes for our body, you know, we can't literally, but they're definitely homes for our mind and for our, our spirit. Yes, I know when we when we talked before, um, you said something very powerful about, you know, walking and writing, writing and walking, um, you know, the healing act of writing. And, you know, that 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 came out for me very powerfully. Um, yeah. So I'm glad you've touched on yeah. that. There. It's such an interesting question. I feel like I could have a whole yeah. hour on. Uh, it's it's absolutely home. fascinating. And it's something that I will continue exploring so, for as long as I'll, I... I will be writing because you know it's something that I'm continually questioning and asking. Because... Well, this is the, the this is the first book in a trilogy, isn't it? Absolutely, so you've got more yeah. to come. You know, the, the book answers, you know, it raises more questions um, and it, and which I'll be continue to explore. And absolutely this theme of where is home, how can we feel at home in ourselves, where do we all belong? It's something, it's a, you know, it's an age-old primal question that I will continue to explore in. The rest of the trilogy and probably anything else I write is something that you know every every human being asks themselves and it's something and I would also say you know of, of course the answer to that question is that you know I gained a deeper sense of home through gaining that connection with nature and that's how I gained a sense of home in this book because walking and connecting with nature and realizing my profound connection with the wild and wilderness and with the natural landscape gave me a sense of home because it made me feel at home in myself and in the world more than I had done before. Because also people say, um, you know, is it scary for you walking through the countryside as a woman of color? Is it why do, do, do brown ethnic minorities not go to the countryside because it's scary for them? I was like, it's just absolutely ridiculous. Obviously I stick out like a sore brown thumb in the countryside. However, I would encourage everyone to go and to the, you know, the nat natural landscapes in the countryside because I, I say, you know, a bird or a butterfly is not going to ask you where you're from. They don't care. So the nature is incredibly unjudgmental in that way, but it's still a living thing. They're still living. You can walk by a river and it's a very alive, they're living entities, but you know, a bird or a butterfly, these kind of living creatures, they could not care less where you're from. And that's an incredibly liberating thing. And so for me, you know, the books are very much about friendship as well. Because as I said, it, you know, it has the death of a friend in the book. And it was a, it was about me finding companionship and solace in nature. And I do think you can find companionship with the birds and the natural world and wildlife because they're you know they're living they're living entities and they can bring a great deal of solace and people have sought solace in nature since since the dawn of time it's an incredibly primal thing and so in answer to the question of home you know I found a greater sense of home and belonging in my connection with nature which is important to spell out because I know our event is part of the celebrating the natural world which as you say all of us have come to appreciate more in lockdown mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, such an interesting question. Now we've only got about five minutes left and I'm going to ask you one more question, yeah. which, which again, probably we could talk about for a long time, but um, Sarah Jane Roberts is asking, yeah. which writers and poets have inspired you the most and which landscapes would you love to wander and visit the most post pandemic? Thank you. If that's Sarah Jane Roberts from Manchester Lit Festival. Indeed. Big, yes, it is indeed. Hello, Manchester. Big <laughs> shout out to the Manchester Massive out there. It's nice to have you out there. 
Manchester's at the heart of this book. And it's great that the British Library is like going northern in the Zoom sessions as well and reaching the north. So, so many different inspirations. I was inspired by, in this, the writing of this book, I was inspired by um, fe um, female nature, right? Female writers and adventurers who've made epic journeys. So, there's a book called Tracks by Robin Davidson, there's Wild by Cheryl Strayed. Um, in terms of a in terms of a, a quote a, an inspirational quote that's always inspired me it's Toni Morrison if there's a book you want to read and it hasn't been written yet then you must write it and for me you know I have a lot of inspirations like the writers I've just mentioned um Margaret Atwood was, was very inspirational to me to, in our bird watching adventure and um but ultimately I don't feel that you know I don't feel that I've seen myself or my story reflected in a book before and why does anyone become a writer if not to make a home for their own story so I feel to use that journey and path metaphor I feel that I'm in, um, following in the footsteps of all these writers that have come before me they powered me on and inspired me like I talk about uh, a Pennine journey that book is you know influential to my book Wainwright's Pennine journey but you know he was making his adventurers a white man and to be honest the book's incredibly misogynistic it's quite shockingly so <laughs> so I am like I have these inspirations but I am also forging a path of my own and that's why I think anyone becomes a writer you have these influences and inspirations but then you you make your own path as well another inspiration if I can just very very quickly read it is um the fantastic Antonio Machado um and there's a path because the book's about following um preset footpaths but it's also about forging your own path um, as you go as well. And this is a very, very, very short, but this has been incredibly inspirational to me. It's Antonio Machado, Spanish poet. Traveller, your footprints are the only road, nothing else. Traveller, there is no road. You make your own path as you walk. As you walk, you make your own road. And when you look back, you see the path you will never travel again. Traveller, there is no road, only a ship's wake on the sea. And that to me, I was just found that so haunting because it's saying, you know, we all follow the, the footpaths that have been made, but each and every one of us is unique. Like we have a unique thumbprint. Each of our paths through life is unique. We all make our um, unique path through life. And that's the kind of the paradox of being human because we're all fundamentally the same, connected and need, we all, you know, need oxygen to live but at the same time we're all unique as well so it was that kind of paradox I wanted to convey in the book as well. What an absolutely glorious perfect note to finish on um it's been it's been so inspiring listening to you Anita and um that hour's gone so quickly yes, and there's so much more I could have Thank asked you. you um now you yeah. can buy a copy of I Belong Here this I think magnificent book um, via the bookshop tab on your screen. I think it's in the menu above. I can't, I can't see it, but I hope you can find it because I hope very much that you will want to buy it. Um, uh, thank you so much for joining us and for watching and for your thoughtful questions. Uh, and of course, thank you so, so much to Anita for being such a wonderful interviewee and, and writing such a, uh, an extraordinary book and a redemptive book and in so many ways a book that we need to read right now you know coming out of something so very terrible I think you've heard what magic Anita has weaved from oh. that experience so well, thank, thank you, you so much. Caroline thank you for being such a wonderful interviewer and such a perceptive and insightful reader it's it's just an absolute privilege to be interviewed by you oh totally and thank you okay. to the British Library for hosting us we're thrilled to have been hosted by um, a forum that's also hosted Dolly Parton, as Caroline and I are both Dolly we're, Parton. We're big fans. Yes, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll get her next. We'll get her along next time. Yeah. And thanks to everyone watching at home. And thank you to each and every reader who ends up buying the book and reading it. A huge thank you to Anita and Caroline for that fantastic discussion and just a reminder that if you want to buy the book you can do so using the link just above the video. You can also give us your feedback, it's really important to us so please do take the time and if you're able you can donate to the British Library.
If you've enjoyed this event, do check out our season on nature and environment, and that's called The Natural Word. Thank you and good night from the British Library.